Hi, welcome to the lecture on software engineering design concepts. The topics to be covered in this lecture are design within the context of SE, the design process, the various design concepts, the software architecture, the architectural style and the architectural design. When you look at software design, what is software design? Software design is a set of principles, concepts and practices that basically leads to the development of a high quality system or a product. So these principles will basically guide the design work that anybody needs to perform. So the design is pivotal to successful SE. So that is why software design gains much of importance. When you look into the concept of design within the context of SE, so the software design is at the technical kernel of SE. So irrespective of the software process model that you are going to use, software design needs to be done and followed. So once software requirements are analyzed and modeled, software design is the last activity with modeling and it will set the stage for construction. So construction basically combines writing code and testing. So when you look at each of the elements of the requirements model, if you could probably refer Roger S. Pressman textbook chapters 9 through 11, this will give you information necessary to create the four design models for a complete specification of design. So when you look at design within the context of SE, so we have scenario based elements, behavioral elements and class based elements. In the pyramid, we have the data or class design, the architectural design, the interface design and on top lies the component level design. When you look at data design or class design, so these are uh, discussed in chapter 10 of the Roger S. Pressman textbook. So this transforms the class models into design class realizations. The objects and relationships defined in the CRC diagram and the content are depicted by attributes and other notations. Then we have the architectural design again discussed in chapter 13 of the Roger S. Pressman textbook. This defines the relationship between major structural elements of the software, the styles and the patterns. So this design representation called the architectural design representation will serve as a framework for a computer based system. If you look at interface design, interface design basically talks of how the software communicates with systems that interoperate with it and with humans. Humans are going to use the system. So an interface basically depicts the flow of information and behavior. When you look into the design process, software design is definitely an iterative process where you take the set of requirements, translate them into a blueprint before you start constructing the software and that blueprint which will basically give me a holistic view of the software is the design. So at the start of the design process, the design is going to be at a higher level of abstraction. And then as you proceed, you can go for representations at much lower levels of abstraction. That is what we term it a subsequent refinement. Then Looking at software quality guidelines and attributes, there are three basic characteristics that need to be satisfied whenever you call something to be a good design. They are all explicit requirements and implicit requirements desired by the stakeholders 
need to be implemented. The design should be readable and understandable for those who are probably going to write the code in the next phase. Very importantly for those who would be subsequently doing testing in the following phase. Then the design should give a complete picture of the software and it should probably discuss on three different domains namely data, functional and behavioral domains. When you talk of quality guidelines, in order to evaluate the quality of a design, so there should be some kind of technical criteria that needs to be established for good design. So any kind of a design should exhibit an architecture that is created using suitable architectural styles and patterns and it should always be evolutionary in nature. It should be modular where it should be logically partitioned into subsystems. It should contain distinct representations of the data, architecture, interfaces and components. It should have suitable data structures that will probably look at the different classes of systems and their corresponding patterns. Then they should all exhibit independent functional characteristics. Then any kind of an interface should probably reduce the complexity of the connections between components. And whenever you do any kind of a design that probably needs to be derived from a repeatable method. And a design should be represented using notations that you could probably used to effectively communicate its meaning. So the quality attributes are in short called FURPS. Functionality. How do you assess it? You evaluate the features, the capabilities and so on. And then the security of the overall system is also evaluated. U usability. Considering human factors, aesthetics, documentation, consistency and so on. R. Reliability. So measure the frequency and severity of failure, the accuracy of output results and more importantly we call it as MTTF, the mean time to failure. And the ability to recover from errors is also important. P is performance that basically talks of processing speed, response time, resource consumption, throughput and efficiency. And last is S, supportability that basically combines different aspects like the extensibility, adaptability and serviceability. These are the five key quality attributes in short as F, U, R, P, S functionality, U usability, R reliability, P performance, S is supportability. When you look into the design concepts, we have a number of concepts right from abstraction to refactoring. In addition, we have also object oriented design concepts like the design classes, the dependency inversion and design for test each one we would quickly run through its meaning and what it basically specifies. Abstraction. Abstraction is a concept that most of you are aware of. Abstraction is a concept that anybody who has learned object-oriented programming is very well aware of. What is abstraction? The standard definition of abstraction says Project the necessary details, hide the implementation details. You can define abstraction at various levels. Here we talk of procedural abstraction and data abstraction. Procedural abstraction refers to a sequence of instructions 
that have a specific and limited function. For example, if I can talk of the word open for a door, open the door means you walk to the door, reach out, grasp the knob, turn the knob, pull the door, step away from moving the door, etc. I do not tell all of these things, right? I tell somebody, can you please go open the door? All of these things are inherent and implied. That is procedural abstraction. The next is data abstraction. Data abstraction is a named collection of data that describes a particular data object. When you look into the architecture, what is an architecture? Architecture is a structure or an organization of different program components, what we call them as modules, how they interact with each other and how is their structure. We have different models right from structure to framework, dynamic process and functional models. When you look into as a pattern, pattern is also another common word most of you are aware of. So you might have seen or asked in the college, what is the pattern of the question paper for my examination? What is a pattern? Pattern is a blueprint, right? Same way here, what is a pattern? The pattern basically conveys the essence of a proven solution to a recurring problem. So this pattern basically is used to solve a particular design problem within a very specific context. So when you talk of the design pattern, you should always think of whether the pattern is applicable to the current work, whether you can reuse it and whether you know this will probably guide you in developing a similar but structurally different pattern. Then you have separation of concerns. Separation of concerns says, you know, you take any kind of a complex problem. This complex problem can be easily handled if you can probably split this problem into smaller sub pieces. Then what you do, you solve each of these smaller problems separately and independently then it is going to be much easier than probably you know attacking a problem which is of much bigger size you might have heard of this many times even in you know kids stories yeah it is called divide and conquer so when you are a larger entity it is going to be difficult to capture so what i do is you know i split and then try to capture and that is what is separation of concerns. So uh, what is a concern? A concern could be a feature or a behavior that is part of the requirements model. So what you do here is, you know, when you can separate concerns into smaller manageable pieces, you know, attacking this problem would probably take less amount of effort and time. Then we have modularity. Modularity is the most common manifestation of separation of concerns. Same thing here, right? So modularity basically involves dividing a software into small manageable addressable components called modules. So when you look at the effort and the cost to develop an individual software module, it basically decreases as the total number of modules increases. So when the number of modules grows, the effort also grows. So that is what is depicted in the graph here on this slide. Then you have information hiding. Basically, this concept is also a common concept available in object-oriented programming. Information hiding hides things basically for one key reason, which is security. So what we do here is 
modules to be characterized by design decisions that hides from all others. So if you look at this concept, modules should be specified and designed so that information within a module is not accessible to other modules. Very important. So we have something called functional independence. Functional independence basically talks of single-mindedness function. There are two things here. One is called cohesion. The other one is called coupling. Cohesion basically talks of the relative functional strength of a module. Coupling basically talks of the relative interdependence among modules. When you talk of cohesion, cohesion basically says perform a single task that probably will require minimum interaction with other components. So to put in very simple terms, cohesion says that module should ideally do just one thing at a time. So at all times, I always strive to have high cohesion. Coupling is the relative interdependence among modules. So coupling will basically depend on the interface complexity, point at which entry or reference is made and so on. So I always try for the lowest possible coupling. Because uh, the lowest possible coupling is advantageous for one simple reason. If the interdependence among modules is higher, coupling is higher. Any change to a particular module will probably propagate unintended side effects to other modules and what we call it as the ripple effect will happen. So my objective is to probably reduce the ripple effect and hence I always strive to have less amount of coupling. Then we have something called refinement. Refinement is a process of elaboration. So you start with the statement of function defined at a higher level of abstraction. Then you probably elaborate on the original statement providing more and more detail. So here it is important to note that abstraction and refinement are complementary concepts. How? Abstraction will enable you to specify the procedure and data internally but suppresses the need for outsiders to have knowledge of the low level details. This is basically to reduce the complexity. Refinement will help you to reveal the low level detail as the design progresses. So both of these concepts are important. Both are considered to be complementary concepts, namely abstraction and refinement. When you look at aspects, Whenever you do requirements analysis, a set of concerns is normally uncovered and these concerns are basically what I term it as cross-cutting concern. Then we have what is called refactoring. Refactoring is changing the software so that you know you do not alter the external behavior of the code but still I should be able to improve the internal structure. So in the case of refactoring, I basically look at redundancy, unused design elements, inefficient algorithms, inappropriate data structures and so on and all these need to be corrected to get a better design. So, irrespective of however careful you are, refactoring will definitely introduce inadvertent side effects. 
So what we basically try to do here is to use some kind of refactoring tools you know that will basically analyze the changes automatically and then generate test suites that are basically suitable for detecting behavioral changes. When you look at the object-oriented design concepts, they are all widely used in the modern software engineering, right from classes, objects, inheritance, messaging, polymorphism, and so on. So with respect to the design classes, we have five types, the UI, business domain, process, persistent, and system. We also have something called dependency inversion. High level modules should not depend directly on the lower level modules. So both should depend on abstraction. When you say design for test, this is what we famously call the ongoing chicken and egg debate which came first, whether software design or test case design, you know, which should probably come first. So what we basically try to do here is to provide appropriate test affordances. So you factor the design so that you know the test code interrogates and controls the system. So this has given you a quick overview of the different design concepts from abstraction to refactoring and object oriented design concepts like the design classes, the dependency inversion and design for test. Now we move on into the software architecture. A software architecture is a program or a computing system which basically comprises of software components, their externally visible properties and their relationships. You should always note that the architecture is itself not an operational software. It is just a representation that basically looks at the effectiveness of the design and requirements, the architectural alternatives, and it will always help to reduce the risks associated with the construction of this software. Why is architecture important? Architecture will basically facilitate communication among stakeholders, it will obviously highlight design decisions and it looks at a relatively small intellectually graspable model of how the system is structured and how its components basically work together. When you look at the architectural descriptions, we have some types like the blueprint metaphor, language, decision and literature metaphor. When you look at blueprint metaphor, basically used by developers who regard architecture descriptions as a means of transferring information from the architect to the designer. You look at language metaphor, this will facilitate communication among stakeholders. When you look at the decision metaphor, this will serve as a product of decisions that involve trade-offs among properties like cost, usability, and performance. When you look at the literature metaphor, this will basically be used to document solutions constructed in the past. So this is a screenshot of the architectural decisions basically taken from the Roger Espressman textbook, which you can probably Go through it. It's called the architectural design description template that contains right from design issues to work products and related concerns and so on. When you look at the architectural style, so you have a set of components, a set of connectors, then you have some constraints and they're all looking at what are called the semantic models, you know. Semantic models will basically help the designer to understand the overall properties of the system. So there are five types, right from data centered, data flow, call and return, 
object oriented and layered. When you look at a data centered architecture, you know, the data store resides in the middle, then you have the client softwares around the data store. A data store is nothing but a file or a database and the client software will frequently assess the data store and it basically does some kind of operations like the add, modify, delete and so on. Then I have the data flow architecture. The data flow architecture is most commonly called the pipe and filter pattern. This architecture when applied to the input data transforms itself through a series of computational components to produce the output data. So you have something called the pipe through which information flows, then you have something called filters and all these filters are connected by pipes that basically transmit data from one component to the next. Then you have the call and return architecture as the term indicates is something like a subroutine which you would have studied in your C programming. The call and return architecture basically consists of a main program and several sub programs. So it is also called a main program sub program architecture. When you look at an object oriented architecture this basically works on the concept of encapsulation. Encapsulation is a key concept in object oriented programming that encapsulates the data and the operations. So whenever you look into an object oriented architecture it is important to note that communication and coordination between components basically happens by means of what is called message passing. Layered architecture is the most common architecture where many of you might have studied in computer networks the OSI model. The same way here where OSI model consists of seven different layers. So here also I have about four different layers right from the core to the utility to the application to the UI. So each of these layers basically performs several operations. The outer layer components service UI operations. The innermost layer performs what is called the OS interfacing. All intermediate layers like the utility and the application layer will serve as a bridge between the core layer and the UI. When you look at architectural design, as architectural design begins, context must be established. So in order to accomplish this task, we have something called external entities that will basically interact with the software. So all this information could be acquired from the requirements model. So what is an archetype? An archetype is an abstraction that represents one element of system behavior. So it's almost similar to a class, simple. So you define a set of archetypes. Set of archetypes means collection of classes, collection of abstractions. So these do not provide enough implementation detail. So this process will keep on continuing in an iterative fashion until you arrive at a complete architectural structure. So there are certain steps here. So the first step says, you know, represent the system in context. So you draw what is called the ACD, the architectural context diagram. And this diagram basically is used to model the software in which it interacts with other external entities that lie on the boundary. So you have something called a superordinate system and a subordinate system, a peer level system and an actor. Actor everybody is aware of 
in what is called a use case diagram you might have studied what is called an actor what is an actor an actor could be a people or a device it is an entity an actor interacts with the target system an actor might produce information or consume information a peer level system as the term indicates are systems at the same operational level you have two key things here one is called the superordinate system superordinate systems are those systems that use the target system as part of some high level processing subordinate systems are those systems that are used by the target system and they provide data or processing that are necessary to complete a particular functionality this is how the acd for a safe home security function which is a common example dealt in majority of the textbooks especially roger s pressman is discussed here so you have sensors the product the control panel surveillance system the target system is the security function the next step number 2 is called the defining the archetypes i told you earlier an archetype is a class or a pattern it is an abstraction it is going to be critical to design so you probably define a set of relatively small archetypes like the controller the node the detector the indicator and so on the third step says refine the architecture into components as the software architecture is refined into components i will be able to get the structure of the system just now it starts to emerge all the interfaces in the acd the architectural context diagram will talk of one or more specialized components then you refine the architecture again into components like you know external communication control panel processing alarm processing detector management and so on and these are very specific for the safe home example and this is how the overall architecture structure looks like you have the safe home function below which you have the external communication management below which you have the guis the security surveillance and so on the security might contain the control panel processing detector management alarm processing and so on and the last step would be describing instantiations of the system the architectural design that is modeled is at a relatively higher level of abstraction so you go for further refinement i told you earlier itself you remember you know abstraction and refinement are complementary concepts so you go for refinement and then what we mean here is you know the architecture is applied to a specific problem to demonstrate that the structure and components are appropriate so this is how the probable diagram will look like with the safe home on the top with the sensors and other alarm on the bottom of the hierarchical tree structure which is easy to model and depict and understand as well so in summary of whatever we have learned till now in the concepts of design you could obviously note some of these things like software design will commence as the first iteration of requirements gathering it contains a set of principles concepts and practices that are definitely required to probably develop a high quality product the basic goal of this design process is to implement all the customer requirements correctly and everybody who uses this should be happy at the end of the day then you look at various design concepts that is what in short crisp given in the slide as a summary and then we have talked of architectural context diagram instantiations archetypes 
and so on and finally you probably need to prove that the design that you have created is the best in a real world context and could be carried forward to the next phase which is construction which basically involves both coding and testing so this presentation basically has given you an overall understanding of the various design concepts in software engineering along with the architectural design the architectural styles and what we termed it as you know the archetypes the architectural context diagrams how do you probably instantiate it how do you probably look at these concepts at different levels of abstraction how do you refactor it and so on so this concludes the design concepts in software engineering so thank you we'll meet you soon